I've only seen photos of her up to probably about her waistline, um, but she comes across as a very strong character in her photos, and I would imagine that she was rather a tall woman. She was very strong, and um, she was outspoken. She was brave, yeah. She was strong, all right. She was born here. Her mother and father occupied this place. Her grandfather, Yalagonga, they occupied this place. I would have liked to have met her. <laughs> yeah, because, um, you know, I'm not a person who's very outspoken like she is. She was. I think she is a forgotten lady and uh, why I like to think that she's getting recognised at last is because she is a very inspiring person to me. I would really have loved to have met her because her character was was much stronger than us women now today. And she is a great, great woman. She courageously stood up and 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 not fought as we know how to fight, but, but stood up in ways that made people um, um, call her a troublemaker, when in fact she wasn't a troublemaker. She was actually a female warrior for her people. Sadly, she found so much changes here that she couldn't accept it. You know, she would uh, walk through people's um, cottages, kicking doors down. And, uh, but the one thing that saved her from being put in jail um, was her friendship with these white people that she had made many years before as a, as a child. Admittedly, um, the Noongar people of this city was the most affected people in this state um, by colonisation. And I think um, she's a shining light in my eyes um, because she she knew where she had to walk and if a gate was there, she opened it and walked through it. And if a house was stuck in a road, she went through that as well. She walked around the uh, country countryside here and done a lot of uh, argumentative things with people and, yeah, things like that, knocking fences down and going through gates and whatnot. Because she was frisky. She was a cat, <laughs> you know, a black cat. To me, I, that's the way I talk. And she wants to be friends with everybody. You know, her cat purrs on your legs and wants you to tap it and be nice. And a lot of the pioneers in them days were her friends. So I'm talking about Bulbuck. To some women, she could have been violent, is what we read about her. She could have been violent, I don't know. And I can't say she was because I never met her. Annie Bulbuck was related to Jagan and Mishri Gu. So <coughs> strong men like that would have gave her the strength to be strong and to be outspoken. And she wasn't afraid because she seen the strength in them. So she knew she had to stand up and be be strong for the women and to be an example for the young people to follow. Bulbuck had a lot of friends in Perth. She worked for uh, um, Cat Padbury, Walter Padbury, as a shepherd. And she said, this is my country. Yalagonga did not sell this country, but he said, we'll share it. Your country is my country. My country is your country. We share this country. Which did not happen. I tried to put myself in her shoes um, many times and I think I would be frustrated too if I knew I was able to do something and then all of a sudden it was everything was shut off from me and I couldn't have that freedom to do what I used to do. But for me, the thing that stood out the most was um, how she could make friends with people like uh, this, uh, Millie Shenton, for instance. Um, uh, and during that time, to be a child, uh, when the white man came here 
and and was literally um, pushing the Noongars off the land, um, she wouldn't have been able to um, see that uh, it was a time of um, a turmoil for her people, uh, being a child at that time. She resisted a lot of their their way of life, but she did got accustomed to beer. She was an alcoholic. Like <laughs> maybe after a day's work, they'd give her a bottle, a bottle of beer or a bottle of wine. But she did become an alcoholic. Bulbuck did. To my understanding and knowledge of uh, what I've heard and in the family history and stories that uh, she's been a very uh, strong um, fighter in our, in those days. I think she would have done well back in now. <laughs> and let's be honest, all of us women can be mischievous at times. And, uh, and I think that that was part of her way of letting off steam, perhaps, to, um, um, to be mischievous. Uh, within the community and I think she had a right to do that as well because she lived in a time that that on one hand she was Aboriginal but on the other hand she was supposed to be white and she was being taught the white man's way to live to to um, follow their law and that would have been a huge um, mind-blowing concept at that time to, to forget about your culture and to walk in this culture, heavens above. She's done some mighty things in her life. My grandmother was born in 1833 and she was born here and she told me that they were very careful because the, the Troopers would shoot him and kill him. So Fanny Volbuck was very brave, and uh, she was brave to go where she went and, and told him off where she went, where a lot of grandmother and her people were... Well, they all were Wajak people from the same tribe. But uh, my grandmother was, uh, said they were very frightened of the European people they, because the troopers were shooting them and killing them. And they call it nigger hunts. Danny Bolbuck or Tolbuck was no different than my mother when her children was taken away. She was lost. She had no home. Her home was under a, a bush, a wattle tree, a gum tree. That was her home. There was um, uh, trees being cut down. Um, there were strange animals being brought here and let run through the bush that damaged the bush, that um, probably um, turned upside down her totemic areas. And, and down here on Wajak country, the, the male totem is the kangaroo, uh, Yonga, and the female kangaroo is war. And, and she would have um, found the changes to them being removed from her community devastating. I think she would have had a proper go at them if she had the chance to, you know. Um, uh, it was sad to see that because when you think about the land, the majority of us has been pushed off the land from, not just here in Perth, across the nation. And uh, with Granny's... Uh, um, her life, she was pushed around as um, not weren't allowed to go on her same pathways every day to wherever she wanted to go. Well, I can't do nothing about it now, but at that time, you know, it, if they knew the people should not have built a building on that, um, the Aboriginal people that was buried there. I guess she was shocked, and she couldn't stop it, and it made her angry. Um, she did go away for some time, and um, when she came back, she was shocked to see all these tents put up by the European people. And um, she started to get really angry, 
And I read one part where she went through someone's house, just walked in without, you know, telling them off. And she used to go over the back of the hill here to, um, to the lakes on the other side because that's where she used to get the gijilgis and, and, you know, duck eggs and ducks and stuff like that for her. And that was her, her food. And uh, she had no one to sort of uh, um, get her food for her, so she had to get it herself. And every day she done that because of no fridge. No, we didn't have fridges in those days, so things used to be killed and hung up or cooked straight away and used straight away. She also knew about which food she could eat and she couldn't eat. She also knew about um, which animals she was allowed to kill. And, and one of the little animals that she was not allowed to kill was the little baby lizard, because that's our little brother. We used to go to the government house and sit down there for a while, and, and later, on in, later on in life, I learnt that my great-great-grandmother was buried there underneath government house. She lived among colonisation. She worked for them. She was a shepherd for Walter Pedbury. For someone who didn't have a car, didn't have a horse and cart, um, she certainly moved around the countryside. Um, and how she got from A to B, I don't know. It probably was horse and cart, I suppose. She knew every rock hole. She knew every stream. She knew every sacred site where it was. And that staff that um, um, was taught to her as a little girl. And you don't forget things when it's taught to you when you're small. To me, myself and my family, my children and grandchildren, I think that it's very important for us to know her and, and to read about her and the things. But I just know what my grandmother told me. Um, that, but he, she didn't say much, but she told me her run was around in the Swan River. I think when, when she left Perth and went to Northam, her life up there wasn't that good. Um, I know she got into some altercations up there with family members. Um, and then that prompted her to move over to Durian Bay. Somebody who can, can do that has to be admired because um, the law, well, the law is the law. And if you break the law, you could either end up in jail or you could end up dead. And that's how it was in her day. And, and people don't realise that Aboriginal law is a lot, a lot stricter than what white law is today. She would have had pride in her land and pride in herself and her people. She had a quality that during that time is not highlighted among many women. And that was the, the uh, ability to make friends with the white people. Bulbuck, history said she had one son who went north and passed on. A lot of people didn't actually like her because of her boisterous ways and her life, you know, because she was a person who would um, go up against a lot of people because she, they were in her pathway and things like that, you know, and wanted to take over her land, as she put it, as we all put it. Why well, I'm also proud of my acknowledgement of her is because through my children, who are Yappos, and if you look at the family tree, there's an old man Yappo in it, and they go right, you look at the indigenous, the Yappos, um, that go right back um, um, to her. Um, so that's what I'm so happy, to be a mother of Yappo children um, and to give them some acknowledgement and some recognition um, through this um, lady. So she didn't only live in Perth, she lived in Northam and then she eventually went into our country and knew it as far as Durian Bay is, from what I can gather. She was an old feisty lady, yes, very feisty. I think her courage uh, to have stood up um, for her people as well um, uh, would have um, 
uh, made her um, uh, be respected by those out in the community, both the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal community, uh, because that's what you needed during that time. You needed courage uh, to, to, to continue to be the Aboriginal person on your land. Daisy Bates came out of England to write the last of the Aboriginal people. But in her diary, in her self-diary, she said, if I only could tell the truth. That, to me, that means a lot. It means a lot. Who was right and who was wrong? And my cousin, um, um, Mr Pickett, you might know Fred Pickett, he, he's a very strong person who had a, a great, great knowledge of her and he used to tell me about her and that's where I got it from. I think that um, based on her extraordinary knowledge of her uh, Aboriginal land, her Aboriginal community, her Aboriginal people, she knew the law. And he, he said to me, did you, did you know about Grandma? You know, and I said, Grandma, I said, no, I've never met your family, and that this is I'm thinking about even talking about it. his mother's mother or his father's mother, but it was the old granny, back way back, who was the grandmother of of the whole old tribe. Yeah, and I said, um, no, I haven't. And he said, and he sat me down. And we talked about it and and told me a story, and I said, oh, gee, that's, that's fascinating. Had she have um, stayed in her own country, she would have been speared, and then she would have had to go uh, through white man's jail. And so it was her decision to leave her, her people's country and go away for those seven years, and that took courage. And, and to me, uh, that shows um, that if a woman can do that, um, back in the days when when life would have been so difficult, um, um, to have been able to do that and, and go forward as an Aboriginal woman, she, she's to be respected. She'll be the first one from that era um, to have this recognition. Um, um, you know, we've got a lot of women that could be acknowledged. I read about it in the book, but sometimes we don't know if that is true in the book. As the people see her, they say that she is angry. She's an angry lady, but our ourself, we, we don't believe in those sorts of things, you know. Oh, that's my grandmother. She is not like that. But I don't know what she was like and what Daisy Bates wrote about her. I don't know if that is true. It was her um, knowledge of the law that um, she was most strict about for herself personally. She wasn't afraid to tell somebody off if they broke the law. And, and she wasn't afraid to uh, accept retribution if she broke the law. The stories I get told by family is, is my uh, better knowledge, yeah, from family members. And that's how I believe it better. People are now starting to recognise the female um, place within the community. And as a result of it, um, being able to read about Fanny Bulbo, uh, read her story, um, read how, how her uh, in-depth knowledge of her community um, ha has been highlighted by some of our writers, such as Daisy Bates. She lived up in the hills, Mamba, but she lived there with um, Jubich. Jubich was her uncle, and the, her other, and the other last of the natives but the children were all taken to Nunausia. Even Jubid's children were taken to Nunausia. Even Kayanga's children were taken to Nunausia. And so most of the children were handed over to Solvata, 
for protection and to learn the English way of life. Well, I feel really bad for that because I was brought up on a reserve too, you know, in Northern, and um, we just lived in camps and things. And, and uh, for her, would what the white people say that she was a, you know, had knowledge, for her to end up in the reserve is very sad. Because she was t- sort of taken away from where she lived and where she held her part of the land where she loved, you know. And uh, a lot of our old people, if they're taken away from their birthright place, they uh, intend to dwindle and, and uh, don't live very long. They like to stay on their own ground where they were born. As soon as we pass, we want to go back home and be buried. And that's probably one of the reasons that she came back to Welshpool, where there was, I don't know how big Welshpool Reserve was, um, but she probably found some comfort um, coming back there among some people that she may have known. Well, for me, it's around ensuring that the stories about women are treasured. For many years, we've had stories about our menfolk. You look at, uh, as an example, stories around Yagan and the work that he was doing in trying to bring the new settlers to this country together with the traditional owners. But we haven't had the same sorts of stories around our heroic women who did many of the same sorts of things, and I think it's time to do that. I think it's very important to... um, um know all about uh, old Granny Fanny uh, because she was uh, she was a great matriarch within her family back then and uh, even though we're a much younger generation here we still think of her as 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 a a living person really um, because she was always a, a hero in our eyes for us women that is I think the biggest benefit that we can learn from Fanny is the fact that she got on with both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And if you can do that in today's world, then you've won my respect. And that's what Fanny did back then. She, she, she won the respect and the friendship uh, because um, she worked with both sides of the people, the white and the Aboriginal. And it's not only her own family, but also the Aboriginal communities on the outskirts of Noongar country where, where she was banned to. Well, to Aboriginal men, women was under them. The Aboriginal men were the leaders. And, you know, they have meetings and everything had to go through them. The women were just workers. You know, the women had to do all the work. Well, let's say the world is dominated by men um, and even our own men. Um, They think that men have to be um, above women, um, but that's not in my case. I don't believe so because the men were hunters and gatherers and it was a woman that kept the family going. And if you educate a community, you educate it through a woman. Um, So I don't think that there is enough of us acknowledging our Aboriginal women. A lot of people are starting to realise that um, uh, Wajak Noongar country is matrilineal and it's a women's country. And and the women's um, uh, are the brilliars of this country. To know that uh, we had a great granny Great, great granny that was very strong in here in the city, living here long before the tall, tall buildings was put up and things like that. You know. To us as Nunga women, um, she's um, we've all got a soft spot for for her as a woman, um, and she's certainly admired among my community where I come from in Ewart. Um, so I suppose that's the difference. We've known about her all our lives um, while we were growing up and then with the non-Aboriginal people they'll just become t- 
get to know a story about a woman, um, whether it's her or another Aboriginal woman, but particularly about her and her struggles of survival, especially here in the metro area. And I think Fanny Bulbuck had people like her in her life would help her. She wouldn't have lived so long, wouldn't she?